Uh, although I do have a question that I was asked, mm -hmm. and I need to know your response to this. Okay. Would you rather be a helicopter or a low-level Jedi? What? Welcome back to Poutine Politics, Canadian issues served with cheese curds. My name's Adam. My name's Mike. Mike. Money, 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 money. Let's talk about money. 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 Uh, so, the federal economic update came out. It was not a budget. The economic update came out. And we're projecting to have a uh, budget deficit of $343 billion. And naturally, okay. people are outraged about this. Sure. Why? <laughs> Why are they outraged oh. about this? Okay, okay. From a financial conservative perspective, and uh, I would consider myself more towards that person than any other conservative thing out there right now, I am deeply concerned about what this is going to impact for the future of everyone, every country in the, in the world, not just Canada, but a lot of countries are going to be impacted by this. So massive deficit is of great concern. However, there's no point in putting blame. <laughs> but we are. But we are putting bl we are putting blame, don't you know? Breaking news, yeah. July 8th from conserv from the Conservative Party Twitter account. Liberals will want to will run a 343 billion dollar deficit this year alone. Hashtag Canadian Poly. The Liberals are running a deficit of 343.2 billion dollars. I don't know. Okay. Last time I so, last time I checked, there's a few there's a few points here. One, it's a minority government. Two, every party has had a hand in these programs. Three, every party, for the most part, outside of little things here and there, every party has voted for this spending. Four, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. Five, people still need to survive. The government is spending money on what it should be spending money on. Yeah, and we've said it before, and I will say it again. Everyone gets a pass on this pandemic from a whatever you want to call it perspective. So whether that be a provincial, a municipal, or a federal, you get a pass because no one really expected this like nobody expected this doomsday scenario not even close i mean like again there's some people who are like well we should have seen this coming because of certain information that was being leaked in january and from china and such and i don't know i mean again could more have been done maybe but really how well, much more i'm talking about on a much larger time scale like back the train up two years okay would have any country been prepared for this not likely. I can't think of a country that was ready for this. So if everyone wasn't ready for this, I don't necessarily blame a specific government. Now, they can be blamed going forward, definitely. But to blame one specific country, hey, listen, you didn't do what you're supposed to do. Come on. Really? Yeah. Are we going to prepare for every kind of doomsday scenario that can possibly happen? Should we be bracing for a solar flare that could knock out all of our electricity? I mean, maybe you are. You could argue that you could argue the answer would be yes, but then there would be people on whatever part of the, whatever point in the spectrum, uh, the political spectrum, that would be that would say, well, it's a waste of money to prepare for something that is highly unlikely to happen. Essentially, like this kind of a situation, you know, was probably in a lot of people's minds extremely unlikely to happen. Yeah, and I enjoy me uh, some doomsday documentaries like those ones that talk about like all the different things that could possibly go wrong catastrophically uh asteroids the yellowstone eruption those kind of things are real fun to watch however should we be prepared for every single kind of scenario like that no it's not cost effective it's like insurance you can over insure yourself if you're insured for every possibility that could ever happen to you you're just paying someone else for no re no reward in return so if you put all those writers up there and instead said, okay, listen, let's just pool the funds together. And then if something happens, AKA emergency rating day fund, then we have a scenario where we can get into that. Mm -hmm. Like we can uh, dip into that, which is why the deficit this year, I have no issue with. Right. Not 
But I do have an issue with every other year that there's been a deficit. With the exception of if you have a down, like let's say if you have a recession or something like that, listen, if you couldn't have prepared for it, like realistically, like no one was saying like this is going to happen, then it's okay to spend a little bit. But like on a normal year, no, you shouldn't be running deficit. You just shouldn't. Okay. Right? So I want to... Because rainy days can happen. Okay. Okay. I guess my dis- my disconnect with it or where where I would disagree with you on on that standpoint and probably where I disagree with other people that I end up having arguments about this with is that governments are not designed to run their financials or their finances like a household. Cuz the problem cuz the problem is you're going to lose both ways, okay? If you have a deficit, then there's people that are like you're spending too much money and look at the debt we're going into and our kids and our grandkids are going to be paying for it. And I keep telling people, I've been hearing the whole our kids are going to be paying for the feder- for the government debt since I was a child, you know, over 30 years ago. I'm 36. I'm still hearing that argument. Nobody's talking about the debt that was generated back in the 1980s really anymore. There's information uh, available now where we can prove that the debt that was generated back in World War II has not been paid back. So, I mean, obviously, things are still being done right, that the whole argument about the debt getting too large and being put on the next generation and the next generation is, there's there's a fallacy to it somewhere. But the, the on the flip side, the problem you run into is if you have a surplus, then you, you run into two problems. One is either that people are going to complain that services are getting cut because you either, it's, in order to get into a surplus, you either have to cut services because you're cutting spending or you're increasing taxes to get to a surplus. And so it's cost, it's either people are losing services or living is costing them more money because they're paying more taxes to the government and not getting services in return for those extra taxes. So, you, I mean, the government can't win either way. Uh, I disagree with your fallacy point because it's not that the government can't run with a deficit. The government can. You can make financial observations that say that if you know we spend up until this limit, our numbers will balance every year. And they will every year. Okay. The problem become, becomes what happens if something goes wrong? What happens if something goes sideways? What happens if what we forecasted doesn't occur? And this is where large entities, the auto industry is a good example where all these people that had built their money, put in their pensions, things like that, all of a sudden their pensions were destroyed mm-hmm. and they have no repercussions because their pensions were designed with a model where it never changed. It always increased. If your deficit becomes so large that you have to borrow so much, like in the example of New Zealand, where they had to sell everything off, that's a bad case scenario that nobody wants to be in. So, yes, the argument can be made that deficits are okay. The problem is, is that if it gets out of control, that's where the issue is. I'm I'm never worried about how much the debt is. I'm never worried about how much the deficit is. I'm worried about the tipping point. Okay. So that three hundred forty-six billion dollar debt deficit that we have this year—that's the number three forty-six. Uh, I mean, three fifty. Yeah, three hundred fifty, roughly. Let's say three hundred fifty. And that's—it's an estimate right now, but uh, so it could be less, it could yeah. be more, but whatever. That's where we are. Yeah, three hundred fifty billion. Right. The problem is, is that at what point is that going to become too much? Because there is a point, and when it becomes too much, we have to do very drastic measures. Right. Like it's not as simple as, oh, let's increase little things. No, no, no. We have to sell off assets. We have to up our taxes. So many things are repercussions of that. So if a government runs a deficit, it is fine as long as everything is fine. Well, and you know what? Despite that's my issue. Despite what other numbers, uh, despite what certain numbers are showing, um, like whether it's the unemployment rate, which, you know, again, that was another thing that was pointed out. Oh, the the uh, Canada has the worst uh, unemployment rate in the G7 right now with thirteen point seven percent. It seems like like that was something that I noticed the, con- the again the Conservative Party account tweeted out uh, basically the day before the job numbers for June came out, and then the job numbers for June showed that almost a million jobs were added back to the economy in June. So obviously, you know, a lot of provinces were opening back up, businesses were opening back up, people were getting were going back to work. Um, you know, the, the unemployment rate dropped, I think it was like one and a half percent 
uh, for, based on the job numbers for the month of June. So, I mean, it's like they, they purposefully put that information out there to be like, well, look how bad it is because they knew the next day the numbers were going to come out and the numbers were going to be, uh, you know, a bit more favorable, right? That's kind of, that's when I, when I, the way I look at it, that's how I read it. Uh, and the argument I made, uh, uh, that I made with somebody as well is that every country is experiencing this right now. And so kind of to your point, you know, the deficit that's being run right now, we couldn't have expected this situation and really it, you should, everybody should get a pass. Like, I'm not complaining about the fact that the, well, not really, I'm not complaining about the fact the United States is running a deficit for this year that's probably going to end up being close to four to five trillion, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, is, like that gonna, is that going to be bad for them? <laughs> probably in the, lo in the long run, yes. But I haven't looked, I guess, specifically at... Uh, how their debt is divided. But if you look at the numbers for can for Canadian debt, like two, uh, I think it's like 70, somewhere between 70 and 75% of Canadian debt is held by either Canadians or Canadian businesses. So I don't feel bad about, I, I don't feel as worried about the debt that we have as well because we're investing in ourselves more so than certain other countries likely are. We do, we have a very small percentage of foreign investment in our government's debt. And that's actually a good thing. Yeah, there's a reason why I haven't brought up the deficit debt uh, situation because I haven't done enough research on it to find out what the mechanisms are involved. So I always like to look coming from it because I understand that saying it's black or white is disingenuous right mm -hmm. like saying that running no deficit is the best policy i don't know about that say running a large deficit is the best or running the maximum allowable amount is the best best again probably not no probably no right like in that's the the juxtaposition of the situation like i understand like there's no point in arguing uh oh well you can't run maximum well, no one's saying that and you oh you can't run surpluses well no one's really saying that either the other thing about it is that Without getting into the weeds, the numbers of it, it's very difficult to say. I know what can happen if it gets too bad. And I know how quickly it can go from bad to worse. Well, Japan uh, Japan is a situation, right, as well, where their debt is combined because it's Japan. They don't really, I mean, I guess they kind of have, you know, quote unquote provinces, but not quite. But, you know, uh, Japan ha Japan's debt is like 250% of GDP. Like, that sounds crazy. They're, they have the highest debt... I, I believe they have the highest debt-to-GDP ratio in the world. And they're still one of the mm -hmm. world's... They're still one of the world's biggest economies. When you throw all of the provincial debt in with the federal debt, our number is, I think, somewhere between 90 and 95%. Now, that number is also going to get, get affected by the fact... And every country, again, is going to get affected by the fact that this year, you know, a lot of countries are anticipating drops in their GDP of anywhere between like 3 and 7%. So that's going to affect numbers for at least this year, probably next year as well, because there's going to be a lot of business there's going to be a lot of businesses that struggle to get through this year. They're still going to struggle to get through next year. The government is obviously going to generate less revenue in the next 12 to 18 months because if people are making less money, the government makes less money. You know, I I'm also I'm looking at this situation as the deficit's going to be big this year because of all the programs. The deficit's going to be smaller next year, but it's still going to look like a bad number because the government's going to generate less revenue. And then the year after that, I'm not going to say it's going to be back to normal, but it's going to be closer to what we were used to. Maybe. See, this is the thing where uh, I've heard it could take five to ten years to get recover from this. And we're not talking about the U.S. because the U.S. is going to be snookered for God knows how Ever. Long. <laughs> <laughs> well... Yeah, so like the U.S. has got all kinds of problems, but luckily it's not in Canada as much. However, it's creeping in. But oh, yeah. I mean, getting back to the point, we can talk about what the problems were before. And I personally, without looking into it in depthly, I didn't like the fact that levels were running a, a deficit unless uh, that they probably didn't need to. However, what are we going to do about this going forward? Well, the reality is, is that the deficit is going to be large this year. Mm -hmm. It is definitely going to be large next year. Mm -hmm. Like those problems aren't going to magically vanish. The amount of money coming in will be the biggest problem. It's not the amount of money. Like I don't think the liberals are going to spend more necessarily or the government in charge if they have a snap election. Right. Will spend more. They're just not going to get enough money coming in. So it's going to be higher deficit. Right. And, and that's just the reality. Yep. Of it. Yep. I agree with that. So it's the question is 
what is the trigger point? Where is the point where the people that are collecting their money go, we need your money because we don't feel we need, we don't feel like you're going to pay your debts. And that's the point where if you're in that position, you're in big trouble. Well, because uh, now you can't you can't use those assets that you have to sell these assets off, but those assets also generate money. So you're you're snooking yourself in the future too. See, I, right? I think I think in that kind of a situation, there's economies there's economies out there that are certainly stronger than ours, right? And mm -hmm. like, like I was saying before, you know the the percentage of the percentage of our debt that is held by foreign foreign entities is a smaller percentage, right? Like I said, I think it's I think it's in the twenty to twenty five percent range. There's going to be, you know, if let's say, like I said, the majority, I think it's two, I think it, the number that I saw somewhere was around two thirds of federal government's public debt is held by individuals like you and me in our investments. So if you and me are saying, hey, I need my money back, we're going to sell that investment to somebody else. We're not really getting our money back from the government. So maybe it's a bank that comes along and buys those buys those government bonds off of us, or maybe it's another large corporation that buys those bonds of, off of us, or maybe it's a country that buys those bonds off of us. Like, that's what's going to happen. It's not necessarily that the government is suddenly going to be strapped for cash. It's going to be that the ownership of that debt is going to change. Do I see a problem with that if the scales tip where more than 50% of that debt is held by foreign entities? Yes. Do I think it's going to get there? I don't know. Maybe. It wouldn't matter if it, I don't think it would make a difference if it's held by Canadians or not. You're saying that it matters, but the reality is, is if it's a bond, it's still a bond market. Right. No, yeah. Right. So it doesn't matter who owns that. <laughs> if the bonds decide that it's more feasible to get the money out, then they'll do that. Most people that own the debt or own the bonds, they're not buying them directly. They're buying them through mutual funds or whatever the case may be. Yep. Which means that we're not in control of them individually. Right. Our money so our money if, is invested in something that was created by a financial institution. Yeah. Right. Yep. And if that financial institution decides that it's now time to pull, they pull it. That's what that's what can happen. So so if it was individually held, and I I don't if it was individually held by people and they all had to, as a collective, say that, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree with hundred percent. But it's not; it's owned by financial institutions, and they're the ones to pull the trigger. That's what happened in the auto industry. They, they realized that they weren't going to get the money back from the bonds, so people came in and bought those bonds cheap. And then, because uh, Obama decided to stop it, was the only reason why GM didn't go under, and they should have. But there's nobody to bail Canada out. Well, okay, there's nobody to bail Canada out, but the, but. We're not countries are not countries are not in the same position as as businesses are. There will always be a country out there that would be willing to bail Canada out. If it's not you hope. Oh, uh, there will be. Absolutely there absolutely there will be. And again, like I said, I mean will it will, that's a would it be pretty, That's a pretty big gamble to take. I'll take it. Well, my point, I think I'll take it. Because New Zealand didn't get bailed out, Greece didn't get bailed out. No, yeah, but neither of those countries had the same kind of economy that Canada does. Not even close. <laughs> I mean, about, like, Greece was Greece yeah. when 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 the when the whole situation came down with Greece, you know, almost being kicked out of the EU before the before the 2008 meltdown, and they lied about their books to get into the EU. We're no, no we're nowhere near that position. <laughs> what I'm saying is that you're hoping that someone will bail you out. But what happens if they don't? Right, like you're taking that's a pretty big gamble to take. And now I'm not saying that they couldn't restructure it, I'm not saying that, but the only country that could bail us out, realistically, because we're so tied to them, is the US. Mm, China. We're tied to China pretty well too. It doesn't seem like it right not now, but no, I, I, not as much as the US. No, definitely not. But I mean So unless yeah, but the problem is is that Canada is not gonna change our voting ways because China bails us out. Well no, of course not. So China doesn't have any, there's no incentive for that. And China is all about China. Well, the incentive the incentive for China would be okay. We'll you know we'll buy your we'll buy your public debt, but you need to change certain. They, they, you know there would be a pressure to change laws that would allow uh, Chinese businesses to come in and buy out Canadian businesses, right? Like right, th right. there's like, there's a down there's that... again there's there's a downside to it, which is why I would certainly not want it to go that way. But the flexibility is there. I'm just saying that if it became the trigger, and it started becoming a problem, it gets a huge problem very quickly and then you have to have decisive action 
on our politicians to make sure that that gets taken care of correctly. I don't trust our politicians to do that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> so then they don't have a choice. Then, rather than restructuring it, they have to sell off assets. Without knowing numbers, and we're just, and this is just hyperbole, I would rather see a situation where you have a little bit more of a blanket there. Not a lot. And I'm not saying you have to have a lot, but a little bit more of a blanket than what I've seen from more neutral economists saying how the, uh, the liberals before the pandemic were handling the, the uh, deficit, not surplus. Because look at uh, it, it just doesn't work. The math doesn't work. No. Like you think that running a surplus works, but it's like, no, it doesn't. And if you look at your normal life, you're like, oh, well, I don't I don't run a deficit. I'm like, you do. You just don't realize. It. Right. Well, I mean, I get the problem. Well, the problem you run into as an individual is you cannot run significant deficits before you go bankrupt. A government runs significant deficits before it even gets to that possibility. But not compared to its assets. Uh, right. like, I guess it depends on the like, assets. I mean, yeah, it depends I mean, on the assets. If I'm looking at assets, I'm also looking at um, money that they can bring in right. and uh, what assets they actually have. Same thing with the uh, individual person. You may not have the amount of assets, right? Whereas if you had lots of assets, then you could run a whole larger debt or debt to equity ratio and it wouldn't be as big a problem because you have those assets to pay them off. So it's sometimes it's better to borrow at a low interest rate and invest that money to get a higher rate of return. For most people, that's impossible. Right. 98% of the population, you can't do that. Well, the, and the, there's and the, some part of the population that can. Yeah, and the, what I was going to say is the government doesn't. Not really. I mean, I guess, I, I guess. okay, if the, if the government had absolutely no debt whatsoever and it was running surpluses, what do you think that, the, what do you think the government would do? They'd probably cut taxes, which means they'd just have less money. They wouldn't. They wouldn't build a, 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 you know, like a surplus fund, as it were. Maybe there'd be a little bit of foreign investment and stuff like that. But you know, chances are the government would just say, "Well, we don't need all this extra money," and they'd cut taxes. I mean, really, oh if you God. think if you think about it, that's what happened. Uh, that's what happened in two thousand and six. You know, the liberals had the liberals had run those majorities through the nineties. Now, and and this is one thing for me, you know, because through the nineties, I was a young teenager. Okay. So I wasn't really following politics that much, but I knew about the surpluses and I knew that the surpluses were being used to pay down debt and, and things like that. But now as an adult and reading about it and being like, well, yeah, the government ran surpluses, but that's because they cut uh, money from the federal transfer programs and they cut money from employment insurance and, and they did things that affected people negatively. I'm like, that's bad. <laughs> that was bad. Like, everybody was like, we need to pay the debt down. And it's like, yeah, but at the expense of what? <laughs> yeah, it, like I said, I don't know the numbers off my off the top of my head, so I really don't know. But from purely pure lot, I did a lot. Uh, bleh, 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 bleh. Wish I could speak something. Ideological? Yeah, a purely <laughs> ideological standpoint. It would make running a deficit isn't inherently bad. Increasing your debt isn't inherently bad it's only when you get closer to that tipping point and you can't afford something bad happening a downturn in the economy i would never say a pandemic is a reason that you should have a surplus or closer <laughs> to a surplus right um, a recession yeah we talked about well and, well i mean and I, I guess you were right but not for the reasons you thought right um, trust me there's still there's still the the hammer is still but still to drop on the economy i mean i'll let's just put it that way I think the economy is like any prediction for the economy is out the window. How how is your economic model going to come from that? Well, it's thrown out the window. No, of right? course like it if is. You had an economic window. Good luck. <laughs> Let's just wrap this up and throw it out the window. It, like it, the, the, Dow, it, I'll, the I'll, Dow Jones hitting an all time high during a pandemic wasn't on my bingo card for 2020. No. Right. <laughs> so, you know what? This is this is one of those rare times where we're not exactly on the same page. And some of it we are, but no. some of it we're not, but that's okay. But, no, but we're, <laughs> we're, we're both agree that it's gray. Yeah. So we're not, you're not an extreme where you're running, oh, well, we have to run the deficit as high as possible to try and get as maximum amount out there. No, that's silly. Yeah. And, uh, and at the same point, I'm not like, oh, you have to run surpluses to pay down the debt. No, again, that's silly. You don't understand <laughs> economics. And that's the big thing. If you don't get that running a debt and deficit isn't necessarily bad and can be a good thing, don't come to the conversation. Because you're just, you just don't understand the, for lack of a better term, math involved. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, I don't know the math specifically. So, like, a lot of what I'm saying is just 
kind of guesses at best. So we might be a lot closer than what it sounds like. <laughs> but I would rather I would rather be like 20% more cautious than let's say Adam would be about what to run at. That's probably what it ends up being. Just, just, just throw it against the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> yeah, right. Like I, I just want to be a little more cautious because I've seen it far too many times where people run it and, and – Com- people, companies, everything runs so close to the edge, and then all of a sudden something happens. Like, ah, what do we do? Like, why are we running so close to the edge? Well, well, again, and that's and that's the problem with the way that a lot of large businesses have been running their finances. It, you know, in some ways, it almost feels like large businesses have been running their finances like governments when they should be running them like businesses. Because again, we've run into this situation where we are four months into this pandemic in North America, at least, and. You know, big businesses are looking for their bailouts. <laughs> and depending on which country you're in, depends on whether or not you get it or not. Yeah. Anyways. All right. Well, this has been a discussion on uh, the deficit and the debt. And uh, don't panic for now. <laughs> how's, no, that? how's that? It's not that no how's panic. That? Don't panic for now. <laughs> Figure out the math and then come to the argument. If yeah. you don't know the math, stay out of the argument. Right. That works. Yeah. Know the math. Come to the table. We'll have it. We'll have a discussion. Talk to experts. That's right. Wait. Oh, they're not scientists this time, though. They're economists. Still experts. They're still experts. That's right. We're not experts. We just read what experts write and then try and interpret them, and hopefully we're not wrong. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> All right. My name's Adam. My name's Mike. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>